Jennifer Tilburg for Biz News. Well, joining us in the Biz News studio today is Andre Pinar, a venture capitalist hailing from South Africa. He's the founder and managing partner of C5 Capital, a firm with a diverse investment portfolio spanning cybersecurity, space, and nuclear power industries. Andre will soon release his new book, Mandela's Untouchables, The Scorpions and the Fight for Justice in South Africa. We'll delve into the contents of the book, explore his motivations for writing it and discussed his recent warnings about Jacob Zuma's political comeback with MK as featured in National Security News. Welcome, Andre, to Biz News. Then they're great to be with you. Well, what made, m- motivated you write this book at this particular time? And the story of the Scorpions is a really important untold story for, for South Africa, but also for the world. Um, the Scorpions is a great South African success story. It is an integral part of the history of our democracy in South Africa. It is um, a tribute to the leadership of the ANC at the time and also a tribute to um, how South Africans can work together to accomplish results, to sustain and, and, and build South Africa as a, as a successful democracy. It's an example of how South Africa can build successful alliances with other democracies. And it's an inspirational story of, of great courage and great resilience. It's also highly relevant for the international community today because all democracies are struggling with the question of police reform. How do we get effective law enforcement and policing that's compatible with human rights um, and that supports social justice and that leads to safer cities and communities for for democratic countries. And the Scorpions is a very successful example of police reform. Very uniquely, we innovated law enforcement because in the Scorpions brought together a combination of intelligence officers, detectives, and prosecutors in one unit, which is a very unique combination. But it meant that the Scorpions could take on some very difficult cases um, and prosecute them very effectively with a very high success rate in his prosecutions because right at the beginning the prosecutors set the evidential standards and laid out the law for the intelligence officers and the detectives so that, that there was a plan that from the very beginning was focused on a successful prosecution and this very close integration between prosecutors intelligence officers and law enforcement officials made the scorpions one of the most successful law enforcement units not not in South Africa and Africa, but worldwide. And so where did it all go wrong for the Scorpions and South Africa? Well, often very successful law enforcement units become a victim of their own success. And the Scorpions ended up investigating two very difficult cases simultaneously. One, um, the corruption of former police commissioner uh, Jackie Celebi, And the other one, uh, the corruption associated with the then Deputy President Jacob Zuma. And prosecuting both those two cases simultaneously was the undoing of the unit. And when President Zuma came into power, he, of course, immediately destroyed the unit. And the way in which he did it was to do an unlawful leak of unlawful wiretaps that were done on the leader of the Scorpions at the time, um, Leonard McCarthy. And uh, these, these wiretaps, which were obtained unlawfully, were leaked on a selective basis, so it wasn't the full transcripts. And this enabled the parties who leaked this information to mischaracterize many of the communications um, that they leaked and to mischaracterize many of the relationships. And I was one of the people who appeared on those wiretaps because I remained as an advisor to the National Prosecuting Authority and to the Scorpions. Former President Zuma tried to characterize me as a CIA officer, was of course to try and discredit um, the very valid uh, charges that the Scorpions have brought against him and the very strong and compelling case that the Scorpions built against him for public corruption. And then secondly, of course, to put a marker on me and my family as a form of intimidation and as a form of threat because in many parts of the world, if you are associated with uh, an organization like the CIA, you're at risk from terrorists, from, from criminals, from hostile and foreign intelligence services. So it was also a way of trying to um, to threaten and intimidate me and to put a marker on me 
um, as a target for 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 others. And I'm sure this was done in close cooperation with with the people I wrote about in the recent article in National Security News, the the Russian military intelligence service with whom President Zuma has had a long association. Well, before we get to the the actual charges and what you found out about Zuma during the Scorpions investigation, what was the effect of this on your family and you? Uh, well, it certainly um, having been having had the privilege of being involved with the creation of the Scorpions and having had the privilege to be part of this very important chapter in the history of South Africa's a new democracy. Many, many good things have come out of it. I've worked for the most. I had the opportunity as a very young man who came from a, from an Afrikaner family um, who was not part of the liberation movements, um, but came from a very conservative Afrikaans family. I had an opportunity to work very closely with a number of the very impressive uh, senior ANC leaders that were part of Mandela's government and who were wholeheartedly committed to build South Africa as a, as a very effective democracy that's an integral member of the international community. And that was an enormous privilege, including working with Mandela himself, who was always a great source of, of encouragement and, um, and of inspiration, and an unforgettable experience. And then... I had a great privilege of working with some of the best law enforcement leaders and and senior intelligence officials in the South African law enforcement and intelligence community. Incredibly brave people who, who took on this huge challenge to bring law enforcement and intelligence in line with, with the new South African constitution and um, as part of a democratic system. Many of them have been persecuted since and have been pushed aside. And I write about one of them uh, Ivor Powell, in my article in National Security News, Ivor was a journalist who volunteered to join the Scorpions as a crime analyst. And he was part of a team who wrote the Browse Mill Report, which was a very thoughtful, uh, responsible report, evaluating very carefully intelligence which the Scorpions have received unsolicited from different sources um, and from uh, in South Africa, from agencies in South Africa, government departments in South Africa, but also from other law enforcement services from other democracies. And Ivor was totally persecuted and crushed because he was identified as the author of this report. And he's just one example of many people who really gave their lives, both in the Scorpions, but also in the South African Revenue Services uh, and other law enforcement agencies um, for this great fight for justice in South Africa. And of course, what happened to Leonard, this, um, this attempted assassination of Leonard, in fact, an attempt to kill him and his whole family, was really a precursor to some of the bad things that we've seen happening recently in South Africa, where uh, law enforcement officers like Detective Kinnear and others have been assassinated by organized crime groups. And so I can only pay enormous tribute to... Um, all the law enforcement and intelligence officers in South Africa who've been part of this great fight for justice and for the safety of our communities. So those were wonderful things that have come out of the experience of being part of the Scorpions. Uh, on the negative side, um, it's the fact that um, the Zuma administration and President Zuma put a marker on me um, uh, and, um, and went after me um, because of the unlawful wiretap they did on Leonard McCarthy. Of course, that, that came at a great cost for me, came at a great cost for my family. And um, these cases have long tails. And so, you know, wherever I now go in the world, around the world, when people Google my name, um, this will come up and, 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 and bad people um, can draw the wrong conclusions from it and it can pose a, a physical safety and security risk. Um, can we look at that article you wrote? Because you talked about the charges against Zuma that were made against Zuma and the, his link to Russian intelligence and the, that he was paid by or is still being paid by Russian intelligence. Can we um, uh, l look into that? Yes, well, so the, the corruption charges that brought, was brought against President Zuma, of course, related to payments that he received from a French arms manufacturer. 
in the context of the of the major weapons deal that was negotiated um, to upgrade and modernize the South African armed forces with the onset of democracy. And that was a case that was very thoroughly investigated by um, by the National Prosecuting Authority and by the Scorpions. Um, and those cases are very serious and very well substantiated and evidenced charges. And that's why that prosecution, at least notionally, is still continuing against President Zuma. Although whether there's the political will to see through what's a really important prosecution uh, for South Africa as a democracy uh, remains to be seen. I think the case against Zuma is a really important case because it's really it really shows to South Africans that no one is above the law and that we are all subject to the to the South African constitution. And we are all subject to the laws of the country and that the rule of law apply. And therefore, um, the case should be seen through. And President Zuma himself has said he wants his day in court. And he now has his day in court. But now it seems he doesn't want his day in court because he's been attacking, he's been attacking the, the prosecutor uh, and the independence of the prosecuting authority. And again, of references charged against me as of being a CIA agent in his special plea defense. And so he doesn't seem that he actually wants his day in court. And when the court makes a judgment, it doesn't seem that he accepts that judgment either because when he was um, convicted for contempt of court and had to serve a prison sentence, um, his propaganda infrastructure, which colludes and works very closely with the Russian um, GIU, tried to create an insurrection in the country. And there was a huge protest um, that did a normal, enormous criminal damage to the country um, in the in in the run up to him um, going to prison. And now, of course, he's no longer in prison, having brokered a deal in Moscow um, that sees him um, being released under the pretext that there are too many prisoners in prison at the moment. Um, it will be interesting to see how many people got exempted on those grounds and have been released in similar circumstances to President Zuma. I guarantee you very few, because this was a deal that was especially done for him to keep him out of prison. Well, tell us about this deal. Is that between uh, Zuma Mr. Ramaphosa? Is he in that as well? Well, the president has to be part of the deal, and this deal was brokered in Moscow while, whilst both of them were there for President Putin's um, summit um, last year. Um, no. Something something I find highly amusing is that both President Zuma and former Deputy President um, um, Mabuza, uh, that both of these characters say that they go to Russia for medical treatment. Um, during the Cold War, this was, of course, one of the old and tired and worn cover stories for going to meet with the Russian intelligence services in Moscow. So this was something that was frotted out as a as a cover story for when people went to Moscow to meet either with the KGB or with the GIU um, or as, as part of some communist conspiracy. Um, no one today go to Russia for medical treatment. No one. Russians leave Russia to get medical treatment. No one wants to be treated by a Russian doctor or by a Russian nurse. It has one of the worst healthcare facilities in the world. In fact, if, if, if you were to say to a Russian, particularly to a Russian intelligence officer, that you are going to send your doctor to go and see him, or you want to send a nurse to go and see him, that's a coded message for, I'm going to send someone to assassinate you, um, in the black humor of the Russian intelligence community. So no one goes to Russia for medical treatment. The only two people who go to Russia for medical treatment is Jacob Zuma and South Africa's former deputy president. And the fact that anyone believes that they're going there for medical treatment is just incredible. Um, so Zuma, of course, um, went to Zimbabwe to, um, to promote this money laundering and um, sanction evasion scheme, which, um, which is paraded as a, as a form of... Um, of carbon-free trading. And from there, he was whisked to Moscow for, for medical treatment, but really to go and meet with his masters. And um, whilst he was at the summit, this deal was brokered that he would be released from prison uh, and that he wouldn't have to return to prison as the court 
ruled that he should go to prison. And so in defiance of South Africa's rule of law, this deal was this unlawful deal was brokered and he was uh, released under this pretext. Unbeknownst to the people who agreed that he would be released, he was there was a very specific reason why why um, the Kremlin wanted um, Zuma to be released um, from prison, and it was because he had an agreement with the GRU that he was going to launch a new political party, which, and as another example of Russian black humor, is called MK. South Africans think it's a reference to Mkonto Visis, where the armed wing of the ANC. In reality. It's the Russian designation for it's the Russian designation for uh, the subsidiary of a wholly owned Russian company, and it is the Russian abbreviation for the Bolshevik Revolution. And so, um, MK has a double meaning. It has a we believe it might refer to the armed wing of the ANC, but it means something else, completely di- something different in Moscow. And so, someone is having a chuckle back at um, the GIU headquarters about all of this. But this is um, this new political party is the first party in South African democracy that's been started by a foreign intelligence service, um, and it's a proxy of the GRU, and it's meant to be part of this new architecture that the GRU is building across Africa, following the failure of the Wagner Group. And I say the failure of the Wagner Group because ultimately the Wagner Group revolted against the Kremlin, and marched against their masters in Moscow. You've also discussed the criminalization of the state under Zuma's lead, the, which led to this proliferation of mafia-style interests in South Africa. So wh- where can this influence be seen in South Africa today, and what dangers does it pose? Well, the destruction of the Scorpions meant that South Africa lost the capability to investigate major international organized crime syndicates, and in particular lost the capacity to, to do white-collar crime and money laundering investigations. Investigating money laundering is is, is uh, probably one of the hardest and most difficult law enforcement investigations to do, and it requires highly skilled forensic accountants. And all of that talent and capacity was lost with the destruction of the Scorpions. So that was that was one major setback for our democracy. The other major setback was that President Zuma very deliberately removed many of the key controls that the state had on both combating. Um, organized crime syndicates, but also specifically dealing with um, with the threat of foreign intelligence services. And so the uh, the GRU in particular, the Russian military intelligence um, directorate in particular, was given free reign in the country to recruit agents, to build networks, to establish themselves, and to establish relationships with South African special forces, with the South African military, with the South African intelligence community. And the relationships that were built with democracies, um, the very careful, thoughtful, steady uh, relations that were, that were built from a law enforcement and intelligence liaison point of view between South Africa and the democracies that made South Africa a reliable member of the international community were unraveled in a very deliberate and calculated way. And similarly, um, many of the crime bosses who contributed to Zuma's political campaign and to his political coffers were given free reign. And so uh, we've seen a proliferation of organized crime organizations through all of the procurement channels of the state, for example, um, and, um, and international drug syndicates were given free reign. And all of this at the expense of ordinary South Africans and of the most vulnerable people in our community. And so, uh, as a result, when Zuma went out of office, the new uh, National Director of Prosecution, Public Prosecutions, uh, Shamila Betoy and her team, faced an almost insurmountable challenge, which on the one hand meant they had a complete lack of capacity, because all of that capacity was unraveled, and on the other hand faced new and dangerous threats that have embedded themselves in the state. And so we face an enormous challenge to um, reverse this, and to uh, re-establish South Africa as a healthy democracy, and to re-establish South Africa as a country where the rule of law apply, to re-establish South Africa as a country where ordinary South Africans have a healthy relationship with law enforcement, and where there are good relations between law enforcement and local communities, where law enforcement have the trust of ordinary people and communities, 
One of the important things about the scorpions, which President Mandela laid down, was he said he wanted the scorpions to be beloved by the people, but feared by the bad guys. And that's what you want from a law enforcement agency. You want a law enforcement agency to have the support of local communities and the trust of local communities. And all of that has been lost, and we have to rebuild it. We must not underestimate what a great challenge this will be for a new government, for a for a new democratic government. Um, but it is a challenge which we have to take on and which the country will have to take on to become a healthy democracy again. Well, could the same source of Russian funding that you say is behind Zuma and behind the forming of MK, could it be responsible for the ANC who suddenly went from bankrupt to white cash flush? Well, the big big challenge which we have in, um, in a democracy in South Africa is that there's a lot of illicit political funding. And... Um, some of that illicit political funding popped up in President Ramaphosa's sofa, um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, most of the parties in Parliament declare their political funding very correctly um, in a very detailed way, but the ANC does not. And so there's an enormous am- amount of illicit money um, going into the ANC's coffers, which is never declared. And, um, of course, the ANC declares the contributions which it receives from United Manganese of Kalahari, um, and that has caused great controversy. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. The real money doesn't get declared and does not get disclosed. And this is a real, this is a really serious issue because that illicit money comes from um, all kinds of sources, uh, foreign governments, uh, organized crime syndicates, and all manner of people. And it goes undisclosed and undeclared. And this is really something that needs to be addressed. Um, well, how has the state responded to this perceived threat? And do you think you talked about um, Shamila Betoy not having the tools to actually f- fight crime? So do, do you think the state is capable of fighting this? Well, it, it, will, require, it will require great political will to, to really fight organized crime. And we must begin with, with, with the case against President Zuma. The, the prosecution against him, which was instituted by President Ramaphosa's government and by the National Prosecuting Authority as part of his government, that case should be seen through. Um, and, and President Zuma must, as he's requested, have his day in court. And secondly, he must return to prison. The Supreme Court have decided that the, the basis for his previous release was unlawful. And in line with the, with the court's decision, he must return to prison to serve his sentence. Um, and there begins the, the rule of law. And that sends the message to everyone that ev- all of us are subject to the rule of law. Um, and so it's really important that, that the government recommits to the fight against organized crime and recommits to protecting its own citizens. Because the greatest victims of organized crime are not the great corp- are not the big corporations are not um, are not the affluent people in the country. It's the ordinary people who have nothing, and who get abused and exploited, um, and suffers tremendous violence as part of their daily lives. And this is what we have to address as a matter of great urgency. Is it possible to revive the scorpions or scorpions 2.0? Scorpions were a hugely successful model for law enforcement and a great success story in in police reform. So it's a proven model. And so that model can be reinstated. um, And the new government after the elections in May of this year can reinstate a similar model, whether it will be exactly like the Scorpions is hard to say. It was a very unique experience at the dawn of democracy when everyone was rallying to help South Africa. The US government uh, took 50 young uh, black graduates put them f- through a full um, training course at the FBI Academy at Quantico. And this group of young graduates were the first foreign attendees of the FBI Academy who were given a full training course like they were FBI officers. Um, Scotland Yard in the United Kingdom did the same thing. And so they were. this is a very unique experience. Uh, all of this was in the open. There was nothing clandestine about this. And all of this was approved by President Mandela's government. Um, so that kind of unprecedented cooperation and support that South Africa received at the time, um, I'm afraid we've lost a lot of that goodwill 
with other democracies because of the conduct of this government. Do you expect a backlash from the people who actually put a mark on you originally? Or, um, or they might be accusing you of, or, or that you are accusing of undermining South African democracy. Do you expect a backlash from them? Well, when you when you when you um, get involved in fighting organized crime, when you get involved in um, counterintelligence and counterespionage, uh, when you operate in this realm, your life is always at risk, and it's permanently at risk. Um, and of course, um, you not only face the a, a physical threat of assassination, but you also face the threat of of disinformation. And um, and in in my case, there were some people in South Africa who tried to turn the story of the Scorpions on its head by alleging that in some way, because I got wiretapped with Leonard McCarthy, I was complicit in um, in the undoing of the Scorpions. That's a very good example of um, of disinformation and the kind of disinformation that the uh, Russian GRU are masters of um, of um, disseminating. So you one is always at risk, but ultimately it is worth it is worth the cost because um, you are you are doing a service to others, and there's no greater reward in life than being of service to others. So when will your book be released? Uh, my book will be released in, in August, um, and this book really tells a really important story that hasn't been told before about a great South African success story and how uh, ordinary South, South Africans have the ability to do extraordinary things. Oh, thank you, Andre. Thanks so much for speaking to us. That was so interesting. Mm-hmm.